Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to White House Baptist Church. Let's all take a handle this morning and stand, please, and turn to hymn number 66. That's 66. Hymn 66. Years I spent in vanity and pride. Let's sing it out this morning. Hymn 66. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Word at last, my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurred till my guilty foe imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden soul and liberty at Calvary. That drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did man at Calvary. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There, my burning soul fell in. Liberty at Calvary. Amen. Wonderful singing. Appreciate that. We'll go ahead and uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Now I ask uh, President Brashad if you'll pray for the service. Amen. You can be seated. We've got a few announcements we'll go through. Of course, again, like you said, we've got uh, Brother Robbie Stanley back with us today, candidating for pastor. So, scrutinize him. No. <laughs> but no. Uh, he is candidating for pastor so, uh, today, and then uh, he also will again be here tonight. But right after the uh, morning service, we have our food fellowship in the back. So, hopefully, you've come ready to eat today. Uh, we'll have that, and then also uh, on the 11th, uh, this coming Wednesday, Brother Robbie will be here for then as well, and then next Sunday, Brother Joe Decker is going to be back with us, and that's when we'll actually cast our vote and all that, and uh, you know, pray for God's direction between now and then, of course, and uh, everything will go according to his will, and then also uh, Brother Derek will do the 18th, and then also on the, uh, the 21st, we'll have, a, I put in here a men's work day. But ladies, you guys are more than welcome to come. Seems like you guys have a better turnout than we do. So maybe Miss Tiffany can create a craft or something, get you guys out and bring your husbands. <laughs> then we can get your husbands there. You know. But uh, we are going to try to have work day that day, try to do a few odd things around here. Uh, I know the walls in the back, we all of us men that's folded those back and put them back together, we noticed that they're crooked. and So we're going to try to adjust those. Uh, there's just several things that needs to be done. And we'll mention a little bit more of that tonight as well. And we also got an anniversary. We got uh, Dale and Angela Vanderberg. How many years? Forty. Forty. Awesome. Congratulations and happy anniversary. And I think that's about it, Brother Derek. Let's all take a hymn on stand again. Turn him one hundred and seventy-eight. One hundred seventy-eight. I am so glad that our Father in heaven. Let's sing together. In one hundred and seventy-eight. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. 
wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. seated. Every time we sing that song, I think of a man that's already gone on to the Lord that taught us how to do that in sign language. And that's all I can picture in my head. But uh, he's a great man. I barely miss him. All right, we'll have our men come forward and uh, take up our offering this morning. I uh, appreciate you guys being here today. And we'll ask Brother Larry if you'll pray for the offering, please. Amen. And twenty. That's two two zero. Him two hundred twenty. Jesus is all the world to me. Is he all the world to you this morning? Him two hundred and twenty. Let's sing it out this morning. Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him.
thankful that he's my friend. Hey, hope you can thank him too. We'll have uh, uh, Miss Sharon. She's going to actually sing a song for us next. And then we'll go from there. favorite soloist and uh, so anyway all right if you have your Bible you can go ahead and turn to Lou I'm sorry Hebrews Hebrews 11 16 is where we'll start Hebrews 11 16 <clears throat> good crowd today full house looks good so Hebrews 11, and I'll give you the title, and then we'll get, have a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Um, but the title of the sermon is God Proud or Ashamed, <clears throat> is God Proud or Ashamed to Be Called Your God? And we'll see here in a second, in verse 16 there, that God was saying that He was not ashamed uh, to be called their God. 
And sometimes, uh, you know, again, sometimes you're, uh, I guess, I wouldn't say ashamed, maybe disappointed in a child uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a situation, uh, how, how they behave themselves or whatever, and it might bring a disappointment, maybe not to the point of being ashamed of. Uh, but anyway, uh, God is the same way. If you're saved and you're a child of God, he's watching you. Uh, you're his child. He's, he's concerned with how you behave, what you're doing, things like that. And there's places in the Bible where he says that he's either proud or ashamed of us. Uh, and so in, in Hebrews 11, verse 16, it says here, But now they desire a better country that is in a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. So he was um, you know, glad to be on the same team, glad to be hooked up with. And he was proud to be called their God because of their, I guess, their behavior. And so um, I'll have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for the opportunity we have to serve you. Lord, I just ask you to help me just to get out of the way. Lord, you speak through me, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, that's the only way that anything is going to be accomplished today is if you show up. And Lord, I just ask you to speak to our hearts today. Help, help us to listen intently so that we can better ourselves to better serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I guess I've never, I've never been, and this is going to be shocking to some of you, I've never been a girl, so I don't know how to give a girl's perspective on this, okay? Uh, I have been a dude, a little, a little guy, things like that. So when I was growing up, uh, you know, my dad, you know, he was stronger than Superman. Uh, he was, you know, he was the smartest. He was this, and, you know, I wanted to make my dad proud. Uh, and, and so forth. And so, you know, I remember recalling him on a Father's Day years after my wife and I had been married and so forth and wishing him Happy Father's Day. And he made the statement, having a son like you makes my Father's Day. Uh, so even as a grown adult, that, that felt good. Uh, I liked that, uh, I, you know, because the Bible tells me that I'm supposed to honor my mo mother and father and so forth. And, and things will go well with me if I do that. And so I, I, I like pleasing my dad. I like pleasing my mom. And, uh, uh, and again, for, for a little guy, you know, to have your dad proud of you means the world uh, and, and so forth. And um, uh, I played a lot of sports growing up, and baseball was probably my favorite. And I remember, uh, you know, I probably could make this more dramatic sounding. I could say bottom of the ninth you know, two outs. Thing. I don't remember those situations. I just, I do know it was, a, it was a baseball game and I was playing and he actually got to be there. Now, my mom was at every game. Okay. She was my taxi driver. Uh, you know, she took me everywhere when my, if my dad had to work, things like that. But this game, he was actually sitting there. And, uh, you know, so I was a little bit more nervous, uh, a little bit more, you know, I, you know, it was, angst, you know, excited, things like that, wanted to do good and so forth. And so I do remember hitting the ball that time. Uh, and again, I don't know the situation, what the score was, things like that, but I did hit a home run. Okay. I, I centered it up and went over the center field wall and it was awesome. And so uh, again, in, in our day and time, things like this is more, I think it's more about that than it is about maybe pleasing your dad. Because, you know, these guys that hit home runs, they have a little jig that they do. They do a little bat flip. They'll do a little step sideways, things like that. And it's all about the antics of it, hitting their home run. Uh, but I hit the home run that day. And again, I did, I did remember feeling proud of myself. Uh, I was excited. I don't know what I did. I can't remember. I don't know if I, you know, jumped up and down, maybe said yes. Uh, and in this day and time, I probably would have had to been you know, pounding my chest or something, you know, doing the bat flip or something like that, things like that. So I did feel proud of myself. Uh, and then I came around third base, you know, and the whole team had come out of the dugout and they're waiting on me at home plate. And so there's all my teammates. And again, I don't know if they were proud of me or if they were excited. They just wanted to hit me because uh, when I landed on home plate, it was like, you know, hands all over my helmet, pouring water on me, throwing dirt down my shirt, all that kind of stuff, which they've seen on TV. Uh, so my teammates were proud of me, I felt. I was proud of me. My teammates were proud of me. And then I left that mob, and I jogged back over to the dugout. You know, and the coach is usually sitting there, you know, up against the corner of the dugout. And I got a little nod, maybe a, you know, a good job, you know, at a boy or whatever. And that made me feel pretty good. And I sat down on the, on the dugout, though, and I looked out. And my eyes made contact with my dad. 
And he gave me one of these. You know what? I forgot about pounding my chest or wanting to flip my bat. I forgot about the mauling that I just got from my, my friends. I even forgot about the attaboy from my coach. When I got that, made my day. I think that's what this verse is talking about. God sits there and watches us all the time. And if he can help us, I guess, get our flesh in check and get filled with the Holy Spirit and actually do something that would make him proud. And again, we can't make eye contact yet, but through the Holy Spirit kind of give you a, a thumbs up. This is the way walk in it. That's how I wanted you to act. I'm proud of you. That ought to make our day as a Christian. And that's what we see here in Hebrews 11, known as the great faith chapter. All these guys, they call it the heroes of the faith or the great uh, hall of faith or things like that. And he listed them there. And there was things that they did that uh, made him proud. And so when we get a, a thumbs up through the Holy Spirit from God, that ought to make our day. So, but just as that made my day as a young boy that hit a home run, you know, have your dad give you the thumbs up or even better, you know, you stop by the store on the way home to get you know, a drinker thing, and he's telling the guy behind the counter, man, you should have seen him. He hit the ball, and you know, you're just, just mm, that feels good. But I remember a time that I got suspended from school. He wasn't very proud of me. Now, this first time, so that means I've got suspended at least twice, right? <laughs> this first time was a little bit different. I came home and told him, you know, had a little pink slip there, and I got suspended for three days of school. And uh, he goes, what are you doing? What did you, what'd you get suspended for? Fighting. Why are you fighting at school? And I said, the guy said something about mom. All right, because back when I was in school, you, that, was just, that was it. If you said your mama, it was on. Like, in, in our day and time, it's, it's different. You know, you, some of you might have said, you know, put up your dukes. I don't know what your dukes are, but, you know, put up your dukes. That meant you want to fight. Uh, then you dignified guys. Would you like to step outside? All right, you know, that, that, was, that was the way to fight, things like that. Uh, you know, then I, I remember these guys, you know, push me and I'm going to tear you up. And so you push him. And he said, you push me one more time and I'm going to tear you up. And so you push him again. Now, if you push me the third, you know, are you going to fight or not? And then, you know, and, and I think this is a thing for the teenagers these days. We're about to throw hands. Is that a, is that a thing? And we're about to throw hands. I'm like, okay. <laughs> what? But anyway, I guess that's fighting. But I, all I said was, the guy said something about mom. And my dad said, oh, okay. It was all right. He's like, you can go to work with me for three days. And so that was cool. No school, working, but no school. That was awesome. And, and get to hang out with my dad. So then... The second time I was telling you about, it wasn't for fighting. It was for saying a bad word. I guess I was probably sixth grade, you know, public school. Is that a bad word? I got suspended. So I go home, and I'm thinking three more days with my dad, three more days no school. This is awesome. What would you get suspended for? Saying a bad word. Go to your room, and don't come out for three days. Matter of fact, every, day, every time I get home, I'm coming in there and you're getting a spanking. Because we don't, we don't talk like that in our house. So I'm in there all day long. I hear the truck coming down the driveway. <laughs> and I get a spanking. The next day, I'm in there all day long. And hear the truck coming down the driveway. I get a spanking. Third day, he comes down the driveway and he comes in there. And he's crying. And he hands me the paddle. He said, you give me the spanking. He said, because I must not be a very good dad if I have a young man that talks like that. So I must not be a, bad, a good dad. You spank me. I'm like, oh, no. Yeah. He was disappointed. So it went from this to this in a big hurry. So it does matter how we behave to get one of these from God or to get one of these from God. And again, now, I mean, I still appreciate my dad. I love my dad. I still want him happy. But I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a grown person, grown adult, and I'm a Christian. So I don't care more about what he thinks today. So we're going to look at Hebrews 11 here, 
Uh, and we're going to look at a few things that, that he was proud of. Look at verse 4 as far as introduction. It says here, Abel was obedient and gave a more excellent sacrifice. So we see here he was proud of Abel just for being obedient. And I know there are songs, obedience is the very best way to show that you believe, things like that. And that's great. But it's actually truth. God's proud of you for obeying or he's ashamed of you for disobeying. Whether it be how you act, how you look, where you, what you do, uh, things like that. Obviously, the Bible says in Hebrews that we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. I think he's looking down at Lighthouse Baptist Church this morning and giving us the thumbs up saying, I'm proud because you're doing what you're supposed to do. You're in church. You're being obedient. And so, uh, again, obedience is a way we can have God be proud of us and not ashamed. Look at verse 5. It says, Enoch had the testimony that he pleased God. So not only should we be obedient, we ought to have a good testimony. The Bible says, even a child is known by his doings. So in Sunday school class this morning, uh, you know, the, you know, when that child was looked upon, there was probably something going on in the Sunday school teacher's head. <laughs> right? They're known. You know, wild child, you know, crazy, all right? uh, calm, cool, and collective. There's something. You're known by something. So your testimony speaks. We ought to have a testimony with our family. We ought to have a testimony at church. We ought to have a testimony at work. And if we have the testimony that we please God like Enoch did, we'll get the thumbs up and the approval and not being ashamed from God. Look at verse 7. It says here, Noah moved with fear and became the heir of righteousness. So here's some things that makes God proud and not ashamed. Being obedient. Having a good testimony. Having fear of God. Uh, you know, there, back in my day, there was a sign that you'd see on the back of a lot of trucks and things like that, and it would say, no fear. That was supposed to be a cool thing. All right, and I get it. I get it that you ought to be, especially as a guy, again, all my perspectives as being a guy. Guys are supposed to be tough. There's not supposed to be scared. Things like that. And, and, and be able to face your fears and, and so forth. But this fear here is not like a biting your finger and I was like, oh no, God could take me out anytime. And he could. It's a respect. I want to make him proud. I don't want to make him ashamed. And so we live in a way of fear. Uh, look at verse 8. It says here, Abraham was called of God and obeyed and went out not knowing whether he went. So not only... Uh, does being obedient, having a good testimony, and fearing the Lord cause him to be uh, proud of us? If he calls us, we ought to obey and do what he says. Uh, and then a couple more here. We'll look at verse 24. It says here, Moses, in verse 24, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So as a human, as a person that lives on this earth, and as a Christian, you are going to be tempted to do wrong. And Jesus understands that. The Bible says that he was tempted in all points as we were, yet without sin. So he gets temptation. But when we refuse it or we resist it, okay, and he sees that, he's going to be proud. Here's the temptation to say something you shouldn't say. Here's the temptation to react in a way you shouldn't act. Or here's the temptation to do a wrong act. And if we refuse that temptation, say, no, the Bible says... No, God wants or is watching. Uh, the Bible says his eyes are in every place, beholding evil and the good. So I'm not going to do that. So we actually make a, a conscious decision to refuse that temptation and resist that. He's proud of us. So obviously we know the story. Moses, you know, he was supposed to be killed like all of the baby boys at that time. And he was put in a little ark and, and got caught in the bulrushes there. And Pharaoh's daughter found him, things like that. And his mom actually got to come help nurse and raise him and so forth. And he was raised up in Pharaoh's house. But then he got to refuse that. I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to follow God. And he got to refuse that. That made God proud. So in verse 6, we see here that we can make God proud or ashamed of him. Having faith in him makes him proud. Coming to him and saying, Lord, I need your help. That, that's the thing. I, 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 you know, again, trying to please my dad growing up, I would do some, some things and I would do it wrong. And I was just trying to make him proud. And he would make the statement like this. If you would have just come to me and asked, I would have showed you this. And now we wouldn't have this mess. Okay, so God gets it that we might be trying to go through life and, and you know, please him. 
But a lot of times he just said, if you'll just come to me, all right, I will, I will explain to you how I want it done. That makes him proud. So believing in him that he can handle any situation, that makes God proud. Diligently seeking him, that makes him proud. So uh, introduction is done. We'll get to point number one here. Before we get to point number one, we'll say this. Um, you know, if we're going to make God proud, first of all, we have to be saved or be his child for him to have an opinion. Now, he loves everybody. You know, he created everybody, so we're all a creation of the Creator. And he loves everybody. That's why he sent his son. All right, but the, person, the people that have chosen his son to be their Savior becomes his child. He gives us the power to become the sons of God. So then he actually has an opinion on how we behave. Uh, for instance, you know, there would be lots of things going on in my neighborhood growing up uh, that would be wrong for a child to do. And I would get in trouble for it. All the other kids would just go to their house. My dad didn't correct them. Why? They weren't his. So God looks at us that way. So again, if we're not saved, we're not God's child. We're probably not even going to have a ashamed or a proud response from God. So number one, we see here, God is, is God proud or ashamed of your look? Is God proud or ashamed of your look? We all have a look. All right? We have a persona. We have our image to uphold, if you want to say. Uh, again, we're, we're, we're Christians. We're at church. So we're going to look like a Christian and dress like a Christian. Uh, at, at work, you may have a uniform that they say you have to wear. Uh, you have to wear a certain hard hat or you have to wear this. What? That's, that's your look at work. And, uh, and you can get in trouble uh, if you don't look like that. Uh, and so for, if you deliver for Domino's and you come in in a Pizza Hut outfit, it's probably not going to go well with your boss. Okay? You have to look a certain way. And so God says here, Christians are supposed to look a certain way. I've heard it said before, if two people are walking, coming towards you, and you, you see them, you ought to be able to tell which one's a Christian which one's not. That's why the Bible says, come out from among and be ye separate, saith the Lord. We're supposed to be different. So is, does, is God a proud or ashamed of your look? Uh, the issue is not looking like the world. That's what every commercial, that's what every advertisement's about. You've got to have this to be cool. Or you've got to have this to fit in. Or you've got to have this to be a success. You got it, you got it, you got it. And it's just crammed down our throat from commercials, from advertisements, from billboards. And we, we, we think, oh, I got, I got to do that to be cool. Again, I went to public school most of my life. And I remember in you know, elementary school, everything was pretty cool. Everybody was about the same. You start getting into junior high, and I mean, you can get beat up for wearing certain things. All right? Or you weren't in the in crowd because you didn't have certain things. It was all about the look. I remember telling my parents, my, you know, my grandmother would always take me school shopping. And she loved Sears and Roebuck. Okay? And so I went to Sears and Roebuck with my grandmother. And she got me, I mean, tell you, she got me a lot of beat, uh, you know, beaten ups. All right. Uh, she got me brown jeans. She got me red jeans. She got me orange jeans, green jeans. All right. And there was, they were tough skins. All right. Anybody? Oh, yeah. All right. You had the double layered knees, you know, so you couldn't even hardly bend. You walk because your, your knees were all quadrupled up. So that, you know, and they were colors. And then Garanimals, the shirts that matched them. I'm like, Grandma, seriously? You know, junior high dudes don't wear that. You have to have a certain look. And so at my school, it was Levi's for the dudes. All right. Gloria Vanderbilt's for the ladies. All right. And an eyes odd shirt. That was it. And Nike shoes. And if you didn't have that, you didn't fit in. You weren't a part of it. And so I remember, I'll work. I'll, I'll mow grass. I'll do this. Just buy me this, please. Why? I wanted to have that certain look. Why? Because I wanted to fit in. But that's not in God's book. We don't fit in with the world. We only want to please Him. Here's one. Keeping up with the Joneses is what it used to be said. Now I think they've turned it to keeping up with the Kardashians. And my soul, I wouldn't want to keep up with that. All right? but, so it's not about, your look is not about keeping up with certain things. It's about pleasing or just you know, making God ashamed. That's the way we ought to look at it. Uh, again, I had a lot of you know, teenagers in the youth group over the years. And, and they would always say, is this okay? So in other words, they wanted to try to find something that looked like what I would approve of, but that still was cool. All right? Is this okay? Is this okay? That's not the issue. 
The issue is not, is this okay or is this not okay? The issue is, is God a proud or ashamed of the way you look? Uh, so is God proud or ashamed of the way you look? Uh, so we'll go through some verses here. Uh, uh, obviously, he ought, to be a pr- he ought to be proud or ashamed of our attire. Uh, 1 Timothy 2 9 says here, in, in like manner, also let the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shame face and sobriety, and not with rotted hair uh, and gold and pearls and costly array. And it's not saying that, ladies, you can't fix your hair. It's not saying you can't wear jewelry and makeup. All right? I'm fine with that. What it's saying is that, that what goes on in here should be more important. Okay? Uh, you know, I, I should, you know, because there are some people, they will spend hours laying out their outfits and thinking about it. And this is, and, and again, we ought to want to know, is God proud of me? Not do I fit in? Am I keeping up? Things like that. First Peter 3, 3 through 5 says here, Who's adorning? Let it be not of outward adorning, but plaiting of the hair and by wearing of gold and putting on apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, uh, which is in the sight of God a great price. For after this manner of old time, the holy women uh, who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subject to their own husbands. And so we see here that it's more about what goes on in here that's going to give God this, or give God's going to give us this or this, not all this. Uh, the Bible also says in Luke 12, 22, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, Hey, what are we going to eat? What are we going to eat? Uh, I mean, my, our boys growing up, we would just finish lunch. I mean, just. And they would say, what's for supper? All right. Like, dude, you, we just ate. All right. Well, I'm hungry. All right. So it says here, take no thought what you eat. And it says, neither for the body what you should put on. And uh, some of us, again, back in those days when I was getting that Izod and those Levi's and those Nikes, I was thinking about fitting in, thinking about being cool. Thinking about what made me look. The Bible says take no thought on that. Again, I, again, I don't think you ought to look like a you know, beggar or a homeless person. <laughs> uh, but again, there's some people you can tell. Miss Thang, you know, she's worried about her outfit. Okay? And you can tell she's put some effort into it. All right? uh, so again, to get God proud of us, we ought to make sure we're talking about this. Uh, again, our hair. Uh, it doesn't take me long to fix mine these days. All right, a couple swoops over here, a couple swoops over here, that's it, okay? Uh, but, you know, some people, they spend a lot of money on it, and it's, again, all about that. They can get extensions, and they can get this, and they can get colors, and they can, you know, get this do and this style. Uh, again, nothing wrong with those things, but if that's the most important, we're probably going to get one of these, not one of these. Uh, here's another one, your disposition. This right here says a lot about us, okay? Our look. You can tell when you're, you know, you, you say something to your kid, you know, we're going to have broccoli. All right. If you say we're going to have mac and cheese, it probably goes this way. Yes. All right. The face says a lot, even if they don't say anything. And so our look is either pleasing to God or, or displeasing to God. Uh, Ezekiel thirty three eleven says this, when the Lord spake to Moses face to face as a man spake with his friend. Skip over a chapter, we got 34, 29. It says this, And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony um, in Moses' hand, he came down from the mount that Moses wist not that his skin of his face was sore uh, as, uh, as he talked with them. So obviously they could tell. When Moses came down the second time, he didn't have to throw them down and bur- burst the uh, tablets that time. He came down and he was talking to them. And they could tell on his face, that he'd been talking to the Lord. I'm sure that was pleasing to God. You know, again, if he had been, you know, looking worldly or done something that he shouldn't have done, no. His face shone. Acts 4.13 says this, They marveled and they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. So our look, our, our, our disposition is important. Here's another one, and this is your perception, your testimony. Bible says in Matthew 5, 14, you are light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. Proverbs 6, 15 and 16 says this, a proud look is the first thing God lists in the six things he hates. So our perception, our look is very important to God. Is God proud or ashamed of your looks? Number two, is God proud or ashamed of your language? And I'm just laying it all out here this morning, amen? Our look is important. 
and how we talk is important. Our language. The Bible says in Psalm 19, 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. Thumbs up from God in thy sight, O, uh, o Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So what we say is important. And so praise the Lord I got spanking three days in a row for saying a bad word. Because it's important what you say. And I thank God and thank my dad for teaching me and training me that way. We ought not be cursing. Uh, or even using the worldly slang words to fit in with the cursing. Uh, not quoting worldly songs and worldly movies and things like that. It's important what we say. Philippians 2.14 says this, Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Uh, some of us, we go along and we do what God wants us to do, but we're letting Him hear it the whole time. <coughs> well, this is dumb. This is about the stupidest thing. And it's just negative, negative, negative. So we ought not gripe, we ought not complain. Proverbs eleven thirteen says this, A tellbearer re revealeth secrets, but he that is faithful spirit concealeth the matter. So just because you know something doesn't mean you ought to tell it. Okay? I, I use this as an illustration with the teenagers. Uh, again, if a teenager does something he shouldn't do, he ought to get in trouble, he ought to get called in if you want to, get a parent-teacher conference or whatever that, but don't put it on Facebook. Don't Instagram it. Uh, don't Snapchat it or whatever they do these days. Don't do that. And don't even go word of mouth and tell everybody else in the youth group. Tell the youth director so he can tell the pastor and he can tell the parents. That person can be dealt with. Maybe the situation rectified. You know, it's all well. But if we went blah, 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 blah to everybody in the teen, teen group, now when they walk in, it's like, ugh. Oh. Because of all the negative and all the yakking, and all the gossiping, and things like that. So the tellbearer bearer revealeth the secrets, but he that is faithful concealeth the matter. Tell somebody that can help. Proverbs 18, 8, the words of a tellbearer are wounds. So our language is important to God. No, no gossiping, no backbiting, no slandering. Colossians 4, 6 says this, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you know how to answer every man. This is a prayer I pray every morning. Lord, there's going to be situations that I'm faced with that I haven't got to think about. It's going to be boom, right there. And I'm going to have to deal with it right then and there. And not have time to look up a verse or not have time to find a principle or not have time to get some advice. So help what I say be seasoned with grace so that I know how to answer every man. And it might be that I really don't know the answer to that, but I'll pray about it and I'll look in the Bible and see what the Bible says. Then I'll answer you. But, you know, a lot of us, we just go through like, ah, that's stupid. That's the, what were you thinking? Blah, blah, blah. And we're just throwing out words. But the Bible says that everything that we say ought to be seasoned. You put salt on something, it take, makes it taste a whole, whole lot better. So even if it's something negative, if you say it the right way, it's positive. Is he proud or ashamed of your look? Psalms 86, 12. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. I will glorify thy, thy name forever. So we ought to talk to Him. We ought to talk about Him. And we ought to talk for Him. Uh, the last thing under this one, Matthew 12, 36 says, But I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, he shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. So even words that doesn't mean anything, idle words, we're going to give an account in the day of judgment. We're going to get this, or we're going to get this at the judgment seat of Christ. Number three. Number one was, is God... Proud or ashamed of your look? Number two, is God proud or ashamed of your language? Number three, is God proud or ashamed of your labor? Of your labor. Ecclesiastes 9.10, Whatsoever that hand finds to do, do it with thy might. That's one of my, I guess, life verses. I'm that kind of person. If I'm going to play, I'm going to play hard. If I'm going to work, I'm going to work hard. If I'm going to sleep, I'm going to sleep hard. If I'm going to rest, I'm going to rest hard. Uh, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with thy might. God is either... Proud or ashamed of your labor. Again, as a coach, you're coaching guys up and you run them through drills and things like that. If they're lackadaisical, they're not hustling, you're making a mental note, not a starter. Right. You see somebody over there busting it, giving it all they got. Hmm, impressive. Okay? That's what God's talking about. Your labor ought to make God proud, not ashamed of you. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Wherefore, therefore, you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it to the glory of God. Don't give God the leftovers. 
Right? Give God first place. Don't do what well, this is one of my dad's things. A half job. Oh, I heard that a billion times. Don't do a half job. This is what he showed me. He got me in a pickup one time at night. And he come pulling in the driveway and let his, his headlights go across the yard that I just mowed. And he didn't see the three million that were cut properly. He saw the 25 or 40 that I missed. And guess what? They stick out like a sore thumb. Okay? Uh, you know, if you're going to do something for God, do it good. Do it right. Uh, is he proud of your labor? Uh, if you're going to do anything for God, do it with your best of your ability. You ought to find something to do. Do your best for him. He deserves it. Number four, and lastly, is God proud or ashamed of your love? Is God proud or ashamed of your love? 1 John 2.15 says this, Love not the world. Pretty plain. Then it gets even plainer. Neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If we love the world's look, if we love the world's music, if we love the world's money, if we love the world's anything, we can keep on listening. We're getting a thumbs down. He's going to be ashamed. But if we love him, uh, he's going to be proud of us. Colossians 3, 2 says this, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. God is a jealous God, so anything we give more attention to than to Him, He's going to be jealous of. Colossians 1.18, He wants preeminence. So in conclusion, we see here, why was God able to say in Matthew 3.17, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's what He said about Jesus. This is my beloved Son in whom, whom I am well pleased. He was giving Jesus a thumbs up when the dove landed on Him. He, this is the Lamb of God. He's going to take away the sins of the world. I am proud of Him. But He gives us the power to become the sons of God. So we have an opportunity to hear that same statement one day when we're at the judgment seat of Christ. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. It's up to us to make our look approved by Him. Our language, our labor, our love. So because He said in John 4, 34, it says this, Jesus said to them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. This is why he heard from God, this is my beloved son. Because his meat, what he wanted to do, the most thing he focused about, everything that was lined up in his life was to please God and to do the will of him. John 3, I'm sorry, John 6, 38 says this, For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. This is why Jesus heard, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or this is my beloved son, whom I am well, well pleased. So we can hear that one day. And we see here it doesn't take talent. It just takes faithfulness. It doesn't take a special uh, you know, gift. It just takes faithfulness. Last thing I'll read is this. 1 John 2.28 says this. And now, little children, abide in him. And when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So it's up to us on how we look. On what we say, on how we work, and what we love, whether we're going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We'll have a word of prayer, and we'll have an invitation. I made the statement in the sermon a while ago that for God to have an opinion, whether he's proud or ashamed, you have to be his child. So that's the most important decision that you'll ever make. And if there's somebody here today that is not 100% sure you're going to heaven, you can get that taken care of today. And so, again, I would just come down front. I will show you, anybody else with the Bible can show you how you can get that taken care of and you can become the Son of God. Then, maybe something in the sermon. Maybe you're thinking about standing before Him one day and you're going to get thumbs up or thumbs down. Well done, or I wouldn't have done it that way. If the Holy Spirit spoke to you about something... It'd be a good time to come down to the altar and ask God to help you with that. Confess something. So let's all stand. Uh, Brother Derek's going to sing us the invitation hymn. Altar is open if you'd like to come and just let me know. And we'll show you from the Bible how you can be saved. Or if you'd like to come pray.